So if you'd like to turn there, verses 1 through 13, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Such a blessing to be with you today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the blessing of corporate worship, being in the house of the Lord together with the people of the Lord. A true blessing. We ask for your blessing on your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Of our... Our Lord's mercy and grace. This morning, I, I'm hoping to start a series entitled, Who Am I in Christ? Who Am I in Christ? There are actually 33 passages of Scripture that I have listed in my office that will make up, hopefully, 33 sermons from this topic, Who Am I in Christ? 33 sermons. So over the next 33 weeks, the Lord willing, if God is willing, We'll learn about who we are in Christ. And so we'll be looking at that subject. Who am I in Christ? In other words, how does Christ's presence in my life affect me? How does Christ's presence in my life make me who I am? Now because I am a Christian, because I'm saved, who or what does that make me in Christ? That's what we want to be looking at in the next couple of weeks, the next many weeks. 33 weeks. That's a lot of weeks, isn't it? It's almost a whole year if you compare it to the 52 weeks in a year. Now, there are three sub points under the main title, Who I Am in Christ. If you want to write those down, I'll give them to you. We're going to be breaking up the, the main theme of the next 33 weeks of Who I Am in Christ uh, in, up into three main points. Number one, I'm accepted in Christ. That's who I am in Christ. I am accepted in Christ. That would be a sub point. Well, there's 11 passages of Scripture, 11 sermons, hopefully, that will come out of that one point. That's point number one. Who I am in Christ, I'm accepted in Christ. Number two, who I am, who I am in Christ, I'm secure in Christ. We talk about our eternal security mostly, but secure in every way, emotionally and spiritually uh, secure. And then the third one would be who I am in Christ, I am significant in Christ. I am significant in Christ. So who am I in Christ, I am accepted in Christ, I am secure in Christ. And I am significant in Christ. And if you didn't get those all written down, come to me and I'll give them to you. And we'll be expanding that over the next course of 33 weeks, God willing. We may pop in and out of another sermon if the Holy Spirit leads to do that. But there is a, a total of 33 passages of Scripture that will make up this ser series on who I am in Christ. This morning we're going to start with the first sub-point, and that is who I am in Christ. That is, I am accepted in Christ. There's 11 passages of Scripture that we'll be looking at, not today. But over the course of 11 weeks, um, 11 passages of Scripture, Lord willing, showing us how we're accepted in Christ, which, which speaks of who I am in Christ. Now, the first passage of Scripture that speaks on that, who I am in Christ, that I am accepted on Christ, is found in John chapter 1, which we just read. John 1, 12 and 13 says, I am God's child. That's who I am in Christ. How important is that that we know that? It's very important that we understand that and we know that not just experientially or emotionally, but theologically. We must understand, I think primarily theologically, before the emotion can come along, right? 
Before the experience can come along, we need to know who we are in Christ theologically. We are a child of God. We really are a child of God, in case you didn't know that, in case you haven't embraced that, in case you're not living with that reality or that truth, that theological truth. We are children of God because of Christ. So we are God's child because we are accepted in Christ. So you might want to write that down and put this passage next to it. Who am I in Christ? I am a child of God. John 1, 12, and 13. I am a child of God. So that next time you start wondering who you are or why you are, you can go right here and you can answer that question. Who am I in Christ? I am God's child, John 1, 12, and 13. Don't the devil lie to you about anything. You are a child of God. If you are in Christ, you are a child of God. So let's go back and read the, the passage, verse 12 and 13. John says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So there you are right there. If you've received Christ, if you believe in Christ, you are a children of God because God has given you the right to be that. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born out of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So to start with this morning, I want to you to look at that last part of verse 13. The last part of verse 13 that says, but of God. And I'm starting backwards in the passage, okay? Sometimes I do that. I'll start at the bottom of the passage instead of the top of the passage because it brings relevance to the whole of the passage there. It's the theme of the passage, but of God. That's the main point. I'm a child of God because I've been born of God. That's why I'm a child of God, because I've been born of God. This is what John is telling us. God gave me the right, verse 12, to be his child because I am born of him. I am his child because I'm born of him. Just like I'm the child of my parents because I'm born of them. I'm born of, I'm born of Albert and Geraldine Sanchez, and because of that, I'm their child. Are you getting that? I'm God's child because I'm born of him. And because I'm God's child, in a spiritual sense, um, I'm not to be looked at, at that in the physical sense, if you will. Not in the physical sense, like I am with my parents. I'm flesh and bone of my parents. I am. I am a result of their physical union. I am. Their DNA, their blood, their genes, their, their physical makeup, it runs through me. I'm a product of my mother and father's union. I basically am their offspring. I am their child. Everything they are together, I am. I am. I'm a child of my parent. But I'm God's child because I'm born of the Spirit. Because I'm born of the Spirit. All that He is, is in me. All that He is, is in you. You are a child of God, and all that God is, is in you. This is theologically tr true. When I, was, when I was saved, when I, when I confessed my sins before the Lord, when I asked Him to forgive me and save me from my sins, and I remember that day. It was a long time ago. But I remember it. I, I haven't forgotten it. It was, it was stamped in my soul the day that I came to faith in Jesus Christ. It was a, a paramount day. It's the greatest day in my life, the most significant time in my life. When I remember that, when I was saved, when I confessed my sins before the Lord, when I asked him to forgive me and save me from my sins, he forgave me. He did. He forgave me. He cleansed me. He filled me with his spirit, and I was made his child. Thus I am God's child. I'm a child of God. Was that amen for you or for me? It's for you? Amen. <laughs> Either. I'll take either one. So who I am in Christ I am God's child. Now, someone might ask, isn't that kind of over, an oversimplification of things? And I'll, we'll ha I'll have to answer to them, no. It's not an oversimplification. It is not. It's a theological truth. It is. In truth, biblically speaking, this is who I am in Christ. I am God's child. If you're in Christ, you are God's child. Just like it says in verse 12 there, that as many as received him, to them he gave the right, you might want to underline that part right there, he gave the right, okay? But as many as received him, 
To them, he gave the right to become children of God. You can underline that too. Children of God, even to those who believed in his name. It is simple, but not overly simple. It is very profound. It's very profound. That I could become a child of God. That's profound. That I could be an offspring of God, a child of God, an adopted child of God, born of the Spirit of God. And it's profound. It really is. And it's far better than the alternative, right? What's the alternative? Well, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll show you what the alternative is and what it was before you became a child of God. Ephesians chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 6. Notice what it says. And you were, you might want to underline the word were there, okay? This is in the NASB. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. You can underline that too, formerly walked. I love those past tense phrases, don't you? Were and formerly. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, so that tells me that before I became a Christian, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and I walked in the world system, which is demonic. Which is demonic. According to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in who? The sons of disobedience. Paul, speaking of this fallen world system of Satan and the unsaved who are under the fall of Satan's power. That's what he's talking about here. Among, verse, verse 3, among them who to all formerly lived, or we to all formerly lived. You might want to underline that. I like that. Among them, we to all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature, underline this, children of wrath. By nature, children of wrath. Even as the rest. But God. You see that? It's just like John 1, 13. But God. But God, verse 4, underline that. Being rich in mercy, underline that. Because of his great love, underline that. Which with he loved us, you can underline that. Even when we were dead, you can underline that in our trespasses, our transgressions. We were made alive together in Christ. You can underline that. And then Paul makes a little parenthesis there, right? By grace you have been saved. He wants to make sure you understand that. He'll say that later in the book just down the chapter a bit, verse 6, and raised us up with him, underline that, that is Christ, the him here is Christ, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ, that is the Father. So you see what we were? We were children of wrath before God made us alive together with Christ by his grace, his mercy, and his great love that Paul makes reference to in the passage there. In other words, we were not children of God. We were children of the world and of the devil, and we were headed for his judgment, the wrath of God, thus recipients of his wrath, his anger. But God, being rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, was made alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, he says, and raised us up with him, that is Christ, and seated us with him, God the Father, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, I remember when I was a little boy, I was five years old. How many of you can remember that far back? When you were five years old. I remember when I was five years old, my mother taking me to see my grandfather, Albert Cepeda. He's passed on. He, he lived to be like 97, 98. He was an old man. Worked in the fields up in the Sacramento area, and then he'd come down here and He'd work for Pete Sanchez down here. That's how my mom met my dad. My, my mother's family was a migrant workers. They would travel around California picking grapes and working in the fields. And they lived up north, and they'd come down here. And my, he'd work for Marion Sanchez up there and Pete Sanchez down here. They were brothers. And I um, remember Pete Sanchez's farm on the corner of Dogwood and, and uh, Worthington Road down there. Um, and that's how my mom met my dad. My dad was working in the farms. I'm not sure how my mom and dad met particularly, but that's how they met. But anyways, when my grandfather was working up north, 
up in the real Vista Sacramento area, uh, my grandmother was very sick. My grandma Ida, my mom's mother, who died shortly after that at a very young age. Um, but my dad stuck me and my little sister Julie, who was about three years old, two and a half years old, in the old station wagon with my mother, and we traveled up north. My sister stayed here with one of my aunts or something. Um, and that, that morning, the morning after we got there, my mom took me to see my grandfather. He was working out in the field, and he, he, was, pull, he was driving this huge caterpillar. Back in those days, those giant, big caterpillars that make all that noise. Remember those things? They were massive caterpillars, and he was pulling this, this deep soil, pff, subsoiler it was called. It had these big three prongs on the, on the back. And it, was, it was digging up the soil from way beneath, turning the soil up. And this, this tractor was huge. It was loud and smelly and noisy. And I remember when he, when he came, he saw us, and he, he pulled away from the, the row that he was plowing, and he started heading towards us, and the closer he got, the greater the ground shook, and the louder the machine became. And my grandfather was sitting on top of this big old tractor. And here I am, five years old, hanging onto my mother's leg, terrified of this machine, and wondering what in the world is my grandfather doing on that thing. It was a scary thing. Well, when he drove up, he shut the tractor down, I remember. And my mother took me up, up to the tractor and handed him to my grandfather. My grandfather reached down and swooped me up, five years old, swooped me up and pulled me up on the tractor and sat me on this big chair, big seat. The seats were about this wide, big things. They would steer from the back. They had this bar back here. He swooped down, picked me up. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Hardly ever, I hardly even knew him, really. And he sat me down on the seat next to him. It was a pretty awesome experience, to say the least. I remember that. And he did that because I was his child. I was his grandchild, his child, basically, right? Grandparents, that grandkid is your kid, amen? I can't wait to have kids like that. I, I was given that privilege, I was given that right to sit up there with him where he sat, not just any kid was able to sit up there, only those who were related to him. I was able to do that because I was his grandson. I was his child. And I was allowed to sit up there. And it was such a monumental point in my life that I never forgot it. And so we are in Christ. We are God's child because we've been born of God. And I got to sit up on that tractor because I had been born his child his child. And because of this, we're seated with him, God the Father, in heavenly places in Christ. Let's go back to John chapter 1 this morning. I want to focus a little more on what's being said in the passage, in the context of being God's child. As the passage says that I am, notice with me the first part of the passage in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now to understand what verse 12 means, and, understand, and in order to understand verse 12, we have to look at verse 10 and 11. And what do they say? Well, notice verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. This is still true today, isn't it? It is, that the world hasn't, as of yet, recognized its creator, has not, let alone recognized that their creator is Christ Jesus. Someday they will, but it won't be in a good context. Because the world, as we saw in Ephesians 2, are children of God's wrath. The world will recognize Christ as Lord of Lord and King of Kings but as children of wrath, not as children of God. So, he was in the world, the world was made through him, the world did not know him. And notice verse 11, for this is where it gets more specific. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Now, the only way that we can know who, who John is speaking of when he says, you know, he came to his own and... Those who were his own did not know him. Is to look at the whole of John's gospel. It's the only way we can know what John, who John is talking about here. Is to look at the whole of the gospel. 
Maybe you've done that before. It was, I was reading the Gospel of John when I came to Christ. It was the Gospel of John that brought me to Christ. The content and the content of John's Gospel brought me to Christ. I was saved the day I was reading John for the first time in my life. You have to read the Gospel as, the, as a whole. And as we look at the whole of John's Gospel and come to the end, we see that his own were the Jews and they crucified him. That's what the Romans did. No, the Romans carried out the act. The Jews said, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. They put him to death. The people of Israel put him to death. He came to his own, the Jews, and they did not, his own, receive him. Ironically, they were his own, but they were not his children. They were not his children. Because verse 12 says, but as many as received him. See, this follows along. This is following along here in verse 11. His own, he came to his own. They rejected him. But as many as received him, to them. You can underline the word but there and to them. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right. Power and authority. That's a literal translation there. The Greek translation would be power and authority. To them he gave power and authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So receiving him is key to becoming his child. And receiving him involves what? In the passage there, it involves, it involves believing him. Or believing in him. His name. And in verse 13, John tells us how this comes about. Look what he says. Notice in verse 13 with me. Who were born, not of, the, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now when it comes to being God's child, John says that being born God's child is much different than what it is when, it, when we're talking about physical birth. It's different. John will later tell us in chapter 3 that the way to be God's child is to be born again. Born again. First birth isn't enough. You've got to be born again. And that makes sense because being born of God and made his child is much different than being born in the flesh. John is making this point here in verse 13. The process by which we become God's children is that of the Spirit of God. That's why he says at the end of that verse 13, but of God. But of God. So all those who receive Christ and believe on his name must first be born into this world. Then, if we're to be born of God, we must be born again a second time of God, of the Spirit. Must be. That's what separates true conversion from professed conversion that's not real. A lot of people around here are claiming to be Christians. I can't remember the, the total number of millions of people in the United States that claim to be Christian, but it can't be true. It can't be true. Just look around our country and see the condition it's in. All those claiming to be Christian, but have not been born of God, born of the Spirit. That is a distinct, very distinct difference. And what John is talking about here. Even his own people weren't born of him. They rejected him. He came to them, and they rejected him. They were not born of God. So that's why John says, but of God. Being born of God, God as a matter of fact, being born of God is, a, is a, a matter of divine prerogative. This is what John is telling us here. It's a matter of divine prerogative. The Lord determines who his children will be. He's made salvation possible. He has. He's made salvation possible. He's given us the right or power or authority to become children of God, and he alone has the power and authority to extend that right for us to become children of God. He's sovereign Lord. No one can will themselves to be a child of God apart from God's will. We can ask. We can ask to be his children, but he alone grants it. So becoming a child of God has its origin in the mind of God and God alone. This is what John is saying here. Eternal salvation is in no way a work of man or of human origin. It came from the mind of God. It came from the mind of God. How much involvement did we have in our physical conception? I think it's a good answer, a good question, isn't it? How much involvement did you have in your physical conception? Were you there? No. You were not there. 
I had no choice in the matter to come into this world. I wasn't somewhere saying, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. I don't want to be this child of Albert and Geraldine Sanchez. I don't want to be in that world. I don't want to live there. I had no choice. I wasn't even thought of. I remember my parents were hoping for a, another girl. They already had two. Maybe they were hoping for another one. I don't know. Thank God it was a boy. Amen. Amen, men. We didn't or couldn't will ourselves conceived. We couldn't do that, could we? We could not will ourselves conceived. Could not. In our mother's womb. Now, I want to say that it was a result of my parents' union, and that would be kind of logic, right? Be, be logical. And it's true, but only in part. Only in part. My conception was a result of my parents' physical union, but only in part. Because the Bible is very clear that we're a result of not only our parents' physical union, but the Lord played the biggest part in our being born into this world physically. He played the biggest part of that. I am here right now, standing here in the flesh, with my heart pumping and blood going through my veins and all the chemicals working in my brain, not just as a result of my mom and dad's union, but my father's will. He chose me to be conceived into this world. He not only determined my existence, but who I would be and what I would be, man or woman. He chose that. He also deter- I believe he also determined all that I am nationally. He chose me to be Mexican. You can fight against your nationality, but that's God's choice, not yours. You had no choice in your conception or your DNA or where you would live, what sex you would be, and where your nationality would go. And whether you'd be a super rich person and become the president of the United States or live in some Third world country where the word of God is not even there. And it's a very uncivilized place to live. Nationality, size, my size was determined by God. Yeah, sometimes I look in the mirror and think, man, if I could have just been like Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody like him, man, that would have been nice. I see these tall men, you know, and they're all, I'm always looking up to them. And they're always looking down at me. I think, why could you have given me another six inches, Lord? You know, maybe another 40 or 50 pounds of muscle on my body. That would have been nice. But then Susan wouldn't have, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have appealed to Susan. She liked me just the way I was. And if God didn't give her green eyes, we may not be married. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's not true. Who knows? Turn with me to Psalms 139. I'm building something here in the context of children of God. I want you to see just how detailed God's choice for you to be his child was. This is not an insignificant thing. This is a profound and very significant thing. God not only chose to bring you into the world, but he not only chose to give you existence, but he chose you to be his child. A singular privilege to only those who are in Christ. Start in verse 13. For you formed, you can underline that, okay? For you formed, and in the NSB, the U is capitalized. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give you thanks, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of of earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. This means before you could could tell that he was a person, right? He was already conceived, but he was still just flesh. Hadn't formed his arms and his legs yet. And in your book, look at this, and in your book, book were written the days that were ordained. You can underline that word, ordained. Go look it up, the word ordained. Be surprised. Predetermined is what it means. And in your book were all written the days that were predetermined for me when as yet there was not one of them. This is the glory of God. 
All of what David would be, even the span of his life, was determined by God before he was ever born. How much more his eternal life? We can go to Exodus. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 4, and we'll see a conversation with Moses and God at the burning bush. And Moses is arguing with the Lord. He's trying to weasel his way out of this commission that God has given him to go to Egypt and to save his people from bondage. And he's having this conversation with the Lord on, the, on, the, on Mount Sinai in front of the burning bush. And he's got the audacity to, to try to weasel his way out of, you know, I, if I was standing in the presence of God in the form of a burning bush, I don't know if I'd have the guts to say, wait a minute, God, I just don't have what it takes to go. Maybe you made a mistake. Would you? The Lord replied to Moses in this way in verse 11, uh, verse 11 and 12. He says, the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? I love that. What's the question? I mean, what's the answer? Who has made man's mouth? Who made your mouth? Yeah, God made your mouth. Or who makes him mute or deaf? Who does that? Who makes him mute and who makes him deaf? The rhetorical question, Moses knows the answer and so do you. Who does that? Who makes the mute and the deaf? Go ahead, say it. Or the blind. Who makes those? God does. God does. It's not I, the Lord, just in case Moses didn't know or just in case you and I don't know or want to argue with that, uh, that truth. You want to argue with it. God has claimed responsibility for the deaf, the mute, the blind, and people who don't have limbs and all of that. I got a nephew. He's... Uh, Assistant principal at Imperial High School. He was born without a right arm. God did that. It was God's choice for him. Now, don't think of God on human terms, okay? Don't think that you can understand God. You can't. You are created. He is creator. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His heaven is higher than the earth. So are his ways higher than our ways. That's what he's saying. Now then, go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. So even the words that were going to come out of, even the words that were going to come out of Moses' mouth were going to be ordained by God. Even the words. And the Lord plays just as much a part in our spiritual birth as well just as our physical life was part of God's will, even our spiritual life, even more so. Now, John explains the way it doesn't work back in John chapter 1, verse 13. So let's go back over there. He explains the way it doesn't work, the way salvation doesn't work. He makes three points, starting with the word not in verse 13. He says, not of blood. It doesn't work that way. Salvation doesn't work of blood. Not of the will of the flesh. Salvation doesn't work of the will of the flesh. Nor, what? look what it says, nor of the will of man. It doesn't come that way. But of God. That's where we started, right? But of God. So this threefold expression of John's blood, flesh, and will of man tells us that salvation is ultimately God's will. This is John's point, and this is the glory of salvation, that salvation or becoming a child of God is a work of God. And this is why nothing can separate us from the love of God. This is why I believe in eternal security. Because God determined my salvation before I was ever conceived. Before he ever said, let there be light. I had no choice in the matter. He made that decision then. Then. And that you can prove from Scripture from beginning to the end. You can prove from Scripture. And that's why nothing can separate us from the love of God, because it's God who has joined us to him. This is why Jesus said in John 10, listen to what he said in John 10, 20, 29, I give eternal life to them. That's a no-brainer, people. I give eternal life to them, and they shall or they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Who? Who? No one. There is not a power in the universe who can do that. My Father, and he qualifies now the power, okay, my Father who has given them to me 
is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now, we don't have time to do this, but right there in verse 29, my Father who has given to me is the explanation for salvation, for the purpose of God in creating the universe. God created the universe to give the chosen, the redeemed, to his son. And I could preach a series of sermons just on that verse right there. This is what Jesus is telling us, his people. My father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. We are a gift from the father to the son. And that's what he created the universe for. To give his son a gift, a bride, the church. Yes, we do have to receive, and yes, we do have to believe, but even our volition, okay, our voluntary choice is the work of God or in the hand of God. And if you don't believe me, you can go to Ephesians 2 and look at verse 8 and 9. You know it very well. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Right? So John first tells us that receiving and believing is a key component because even the nation of Israel rejected Christ. Maybe he's comparing you now. He's showing Israel came, he came to Israel, he offered them salvation, they rejected it, so now he's going to call another group of people his own. Those who receive him, those who believe him. He makes it emphatically clear that salvation ultimately rests with God. Verse 13, we are God's children because he has willed it first. We owe our salvation to an act of God alone. It is not of human origin, not of blood, or of the flesh, or of the will of man. It is not. Not of blood means because salvation can't be obtained through any ethnic or racial heritage. A Jew isn't saved because he's a Jew. A Jew is saved because he receives Christ as his Savior. John made that perfectly clear in verse 11. Not of the flesh, meaning personal desire, stemming from one's own personal wants, independent from God's will. And I just kind of put a note here later on. I wrote it in handwriting here. It's going to be hard to read, but it said, Fallen human nature does not seek salvation independent from God on its own. God's calling, God's drawing must be involved or they won't receive and believe. Verse 11. That's a proof text, verse 11. And then not of man. Any kind of man-made invention or world system. He's possibly speaking about religion here, and maybe he's pointing at the Jewish religion that was very prevalent in Jesus' day. Man-made religion doesn't bring about becoming a child of God. You cannot make yourself a child of God even if you wanted to, which as a sinner you wouldn't want to. Scripture's clear on that. Notice chapter 3. Go over there real quick. So any kind of man-made attempt towards God won't work. Like the Tower of Babel, remember that? It didn't work. Or Cain's sacrifice, remember that? It didn't work. That was of the will of man. And it didn't work. God just flat out refused that. Because God is going to share his glory with anyone, right? He's not. He's going to get the glory and all the glory for salvation. Six through eight. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who's born of the spirit. See, we cannot determine how the wind blows. We cannot determine how it blows. And the spirit, we cannot determine how it blows, how it moves, who it calls, who, it, who he calls, I'm sorry, who he regenerates. We cannot determine that. Just like the wind, the wind moves at will and does what it does at will. You can see its effect, but you cannot affect it. That is God. So John is saying that the Holy Spirit is responsible for the new birth and that physical birth and spiritual birth, they're very different. And like all adoptions, the choice rests on the one doing the adoption. God gets all the credit alone concerning our adoption as children of God. 
Now, aren't you glad? I hope you are. Not mad, but glad. Aren't you glad that he has chosen you? And aren't you glad that you've received him? And in receiving him, you've believed? Aren't you glad? And aren't you glad that because of this, you're, chi- you're God's child? And that makes me accepted in Christ. Makes me accepted in Christ. And it makes me who I am in Christ. I am God's child. And because of that, I'm accepted in Christ. Who am I in Christ? I am God's child. Not because of something I've done, but because God has willed it. From eternity's past. Can't get out of it. You know that song, prone to wander, God, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord I love. Or prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. No one is able to snatch me out of the Father's hand. Because I'm a gift from the Father to the Son. And that's something that they're doing. So this makes my relationship to God as his child permanent. Permanent. No one can take me away from God. Not even me and my sin can take me away from God. And all God's people said, let's bow our heads and make ready for communion. I think this is a great segue towards communion, amen? A way to show our thanks. Last thing I said was our, our sin can't keep us away from God, but our sh- sin sure can offend God, can't it? So let's just make sure our sin is right before the Lord this morning. You know, every, 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 first, every first Sunday of the week, or the first Sunday of the month, I go over this communion thing. And I, I want you to know how important communion is in two contexts. One, we are to be ready spiritually to commune. And number two, it's a privilege. It is, that we can do this publicly still. But the first one is most important, the part about being ready in our heart and soul before God. Now, Paul said that it was such a serious, serious thing in the first century. He was telling the first century church it was such a serious issue that people were really making a mockery of it that a lot of them be- fell ill. Some were very sick and some had actually died because of it. Now, I don't know if the Lord is still doing that today. I don't know. I know it was that prevalent in the first century, but it kind of gives us an idea of the import of communion. So let's just... Let's just Get our heart right with the Lord. If there's some kind of sin in your life, whether it's huge or small, it doesn't really matter if it's big or small. We're all sinners and we all sin. We're all capable of big sin. Let's just put it before the Lord right now. Thank him for his sovereign choice over you. I know there's a big question that looms in our head. If God chooses for salvation, then what about those who haven't come to faith yet? What do we do about that? I don't get caught up with that. I don't worry about who God has chosen and who he hasn't chosen. I just tell everybody, because I don't know. But you can, you, can, you can know this. Those God has chosen from eternity's past, they will come to faith. They will come to faith, and it will come by hearing the word. So if you've got loved ones that still haven't come to faith, just keep sharing the word with them. Don't give up, because there was a man that was on the cross next to Jesus in his last moments, and he came to Christ in his very last moments. And God has determined that too. But with your heads bowed and eyes closed, Father, thank you so much for the truth that I am your child. I think that is the the, um, pinnacle of our faith. It's the anchor to our soul. And this morning, may we just express our gratitude by our worthiness only in the context of Christ's work on the cross before you. We we hold no worthiness in and of our own to be able to even take this communion. But you have made us worthy. As the song said, worthy, worthy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And so we just come before you in humbleness, in humility, in contrition, asking you 
your great mercy and great love, you might forgive us for our sin and make us acceptable to take this communion openly and willingly and with joy and gladness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're going to come forward, those of you who are going